Hi, everyone, and welcome along to our Sunday market update for today, the 17th of October 2021. It's great to have your company. In a couple of minutes, the team will uh, uh, start working through this market in a very structured way. If you're a trader and you're looking for more information on what lies ahead this week, we're going to give you it from a number of points of view. Early on, we're going to have Julian come in. He's going to talk about macro market overview. And um, after that, we will have um, Alexis come in and do the fundamental part for us followed by Ash doing market data and uh, Ainsley doing gold, Shukri on crypto, Ainsley back on oil. We'll have um, currency strength index with Lloyd, Gordon uh, Scott doing stocks for us and Jeff doing, uh, doing the technical. So whatever type of trader you are, there's information coming in the next 45 uh, minutes to an hour, which will benefit your trading as you look at the market in the week ahead. You can watch it as a block right now and do the whole thing. We can come back later and we'll publish these in small amounts on YouTube, on Facebook. So you can watch them in smaller bite-sized sections, about five minutes each for each of the sections. So if you're looking for a deeper understanding of how these markets work and what lies ahead this week, this is the place to be. Make sure you put in your bookmarks. Make sure you come back every week and watch this if you want to get a really good look at how markets are, are setting up ahead. Julian, I can see you're looking intently at your screen. Are you ready to go? We're going to do, do macro market updates with Julian McCree to start with. Uh, hey, Paul, and hello, everybody. Um, I am looking intently at my screen and uh, trying to rapidly reset a couple of slides that I wanted to uh, I wanted to show you guys. So look, um, I thought we'd do something slightly different today, just uh, just to keep uh, keep everything updated. But before we start, right, uh, Paul is going to make a uh, a more structured announcement, but I'm going to give you guys a quick heads up. So myself and Ainsley next weekend. Uh, in my Trader Cafe session, so that usually runs just before we do this, right? We are going to have a special, a special on the gold and silver market. What we're going to do is something called a deep dive. Now, I know you guys have all heard of that. Okay, what it's going to be is a combination of fundamentals and also technicals. Why are we doing a deep dive? You say to me, Julian, right now I should be in Bitcoin because it's hitting new highs. Gold is looking like a sick puppy. Well, the most important thing about sick puppies is their investment opportunities. So what I'm hoping to show you guys is where the potential is for gold and silver to go over the course of the next two to three years, right? This isn't a short-term trading position. What we're going to do is we're going to talk about what the opportunities are for this market, for those two markets, really going forward. So it's going to go into quite a bit of detail, a lot of macro stuff, a lot of information. Um, you know, be my guest to pop into the show and also ask us a heap of questions that hopefully we'll be able to answer. But I just want to give everybody a heads up about that um, before we crack into what I'm going to talk about today. And, and look, I think well, one know, of the... Um... I'll ask Mai to publish the links to that into the chat on Zoom and into Facebook and YouTube and Twitter if she can. So, Mai, can you post the link to Trader Cafe next week into everything? So, anyone who wants to join Julian and Ainsley deep dive on gold and gold and silver. Gold and silver. We're going to try and talk about silver as well too. I think I, I yes, think I told Ainsley that. <laughs> so, so, anyway, I hope she knows. <laughs> So look, guys, um, look, uh, what I want to do today, right? So macro. So um, uh, from time to time, right, I could talk about macro uh, every single week. And um, uh, at some point, you run out of things to say, okay, things to say, which is super important. So today is another one of Julian's step back sessions. Okay, so we've had some little deep dive, mini deep dives into freighting and stuff like that. So now we're going to have another little mini deep dive. We're going to look at something called the sentiment cycle. For those of you who have been to any of my lectures or classes over the years, you will know that I keep rabbiting on about this and, uh, you know, I, I will bore you to tears with it. Um, so why is the sentiment cycle important? Well, if I can just share my screen here, hopefully I can prove this to you. So... Um, hopefully you guys can see uh, uh, can see this presentation as we're uh, as it's unfolding. I've moved it around. So what I'm going to do is I'm just just going to minimise a couple of things here, make this bit bigger so I can see. Uh, and um, whoops, there we go. So we'll come to that in a second. Obviously with this, this is a little bit of financial presentation. So we need to, sorry guys, we need to stick a quick disclaimer in there. You guys know all this stuff, right? So basically I'm really sorry this is educational. And if you do buy anything uh, and it goes wrong, it's sort of really not my fault. So please read this and be uh, um, be conscious and uh, freeze the, uh, the presentation here as it unfolds, right? Um, so what do we mean by the sentiment cycle? What it really is essentially is a, um, is a plot 
of the psychotic nature of markets. So markets generally um, never rest in something um, economists love. Economists love to call the equilibrium position. Um, that means that uh, the everything is in balance. Well, I've got news for you guys. Nothing is ever in balance in markets, right? Markets wait, go from tremendous enthusiasm all the way through to deep despair. And the journey in between is something called a trend. Okay, the the terrible, the amazing enthusiasm that markets suffer is normally a topping action, and the deep despair is called a bottoming action. You may see technical people talk about cup and handle formations and things like that. And you guys know if you've been with me for some time, I talk about the aversion point, which is the opportunity to get involved on the buy side when the sentiment is really, really negative and just starting to turn. So look, um. Where are we at the moment? So when I look at some of the markets around the world, and I think you guys, I would encourage everybody to do this. So pull out your daily charts or your weekly charts. Try and get a handle for what you're seeing in some of the markets. And it doesn't take a genius to look at the US stock markets and say, well, aren't they quite enthusiastic right now in terms of that cycle, right? So we go back. This is the, this is the enthusiasm point. Now, what do I mean by uh, the enthusiasm point? Well, from the photos, it pretty much sums up how uh, I tend to I tend to look at it. So, pretty much everybody is on board who wants to be on board, uh, and people are incredibly euphoric about the way in which the world works. Right. So, what happens is the world moves from the fear of losing money to the fear of missing out. So, all your mates are trading Bitcoin, all your mates are trading, um, are trading SPACs or trading, you know, options on, uh, on meme stocks, right? You know, I'm just thinking of some of the examples of the last few years, right? There's been many, many more of them, right? And uh, at the moment, I would think that the energy sector is a really good example of people going to the fear of missing out, right? It's a at the enthusiasm uh, stage, but I don't think it's over yet. But I think it's at the enthusiasm stage, and uh, not necessarily in oil, Oil still got a bit further to go, but in other some of the derivative products like coal and natural gas, most definitely we're into that zone, right? So what's been going on here is the smart money starts to sell, right? So the smart money that's been in since when oil was fifteen dollars or natural gas was two dollars or dollar eighty, now at five dollars for natural gas or six dollars for natural gas, they're saying, Well, do you know what? I've had a great run, I don't need to be here anymore. I'll start to I'll start to get out. But what's what they're doing is they're selling into that optimism strength, right? And so there are some areas that you need to look out for. And so how I like to describe it, actually, well, it was really usefully put on a bit of paper in the last few days by a guy called Jared, Jared Dillon, Dillon, who runs the um, uh, the Daily Dirt Nap. Go look it up on uh, on uh, Twitter. Um, he's uh, quite an active. Twitter e, I guess we should say, or Twitter. -or. I'm not quite sure what the right thing is. But his definition, I think, is really good. Look, when things are good, like now, we think about the future, we think about spaceships, uh huh, flying cars, we've seen those recently. Um, we think about EVs, we think about uh, vertical farming and, you know, 3D printing and NFTs and Web 3.0. So, all sorts of innovations. If you think about people's horizon for their investments, they always think this is a good deal. It's going to be a great deal. And, I, you know, it doesn't matter. It, it's look in three years, this is going to be an amazing payoff, right? They're always thinking way into the distance. All right. In terms of their investment horizon. When things are bad, go back to 2008. Those of you that remember 2008 and what the world looked like then, do you remember how everybody's horizons were so much more short term, right? Oh, I don't know. I'm going to lose my job. Therefore, for me, it depends on how much money I have in my bank account right now. And I don't care about flying cars. I'll come back to those another day. Quite frankly, what I'm trying to do is to get through next week, right? So you see how people's horizon preferences move? Now, it doesn't take too much thinking to figure out when the right time to be investing is, right? Because you say, well, hang on a second. With a long-term investment horizon, I do get it. When you get that combined with a few other things going on, what are you seeing, right? You've seen. So what are the other things we've seen recently? The SPAC, the boom and 
the bust of SPACs in some respects. There's a lot of lawsuits flying around with those at the moment, right? You've seen the rise of the retail trader in the last 18 months and the beginning of that trend to start ending, especially in the States where there's a number of accounts, a huge numbers of accounts are being closed at the moment, right? We're going to see the turn in interest rates at some stage. You know, how high that goes, I have, very, I have my doubts about for how high they're going to go. Um, and also, there's the energy price move, right? Energy prices are incredibly deflated and that will act as a break on spending at some point in time. That break on spending will affect stocks at some point in time if energy prices are sustained at these high levels, right? So when we look at the market and we see what's going on, you can see from this chart, right? You know, this is March 2020 on a weekly chart for the S&P going back do you know what? That was March 2020 was almost two years ago now, guys. It was literally a straight line up. Only recently have we began to see the world start to turn over. I am not, I am not calling a top in stocks today, this week, this month. In fact, probably not this year. As we go into the, the Christmas rally period, right? Why would I call a top in stocks? I'm just giving a few warning signs that what I'm seeing out there have been and is the early signs that you would see in a traditional market topping environment, right? So when you look at the daily charts, look at the last couple of dips we've seen in US stock markets, right? They went down for two or three days. The market bounced back, rallied new highs, right? I'm not saying we're not going to go to new highs. I'm just saying I don't want to buy the next new high, right? Because you can already see the way this market is rotating a different way. So now we've had two waves down and we're, yeah, we're bouncing back now. And the last Thursday, Friday were great for the market. Who knows what's going to come next? But what I'm seeing here is a more active distribution of positions than you've ever seen before, right? So movement of positions, people are starting to get concerned. And if you unpick some of those American sectors, there aren't many of them that are doing that well. Most of them, X of energy, are struggling a little bit, right? So always something to bear in mind, right? So so when we think about this, there's other indicators as well too. When you look at the sentiment, there, you look at the panic, the euphoria versus panic phase and what that tends to say. And you can see right now we're very very clearly in it's a bit difficult to see on this chart but freeze the frame and have a look it's this area up here okay so the black line indicates where we are at the moment and the gray line indicates the future returns right and so as we get up to this point you're expecting future returns to be quite poor when you've had the black line down here you're expecting future returns to be quite positive so this um, the current stage of the market, when you analyze it this way, and this is called the uh, the pulse report that comes from Citigroup. Sadly, the guy that wrote it has actually just died in a car accident, but you know, I'm sure that they'll carry on the legacy. But it's an incredibly important report, and I think just over the years you get used to this this type of approach. So, again, I'm not trying to call anything, right? I'm just saying, guys, take a look around you and see what's happening, right? In your instinct that everybody has, you can see things a little bit abnormal, right? And when you look at the corporations, right, what's been going on the last 20 12 months, there has been a huge amount of money coming to the stock markets, but equally, there's a lot of corporations who have raised money into that market as well too, right? Something like $500 billion, $550 billion has been put into the market in the last 12 months by corporations who have essentially um, sending money to all those people who are desperate to um, uh, to buy stocks, right? And they're saying, great, I've got loads to go. How much do you know? How much do you want? So, um, so when we think about this, right, well, there's a, um, a couple of other signals as well too, right? So one of the other signals that you could use in the Russell 3000, right, if you look at the percentage of growth, growth stocks that have zero or negative earnings, we're sitting at a all-time high. Again, it's not calling the end here. I'm just saying, hello, there may be some warnings. One of the big things, right? I know Ash is really keen on this stuff, right? One of the big things is the net commercial positions that you see in the market. You look at all of the futures exchanges and all of the markets out there where the commercials have positions. Right now, they have significant short positions, okay? They are not long, they are short. So they are looking for distribution. So, and look, here's some of the key indicators, right? When we talk about that enthusiasm point, what, why, how can you see it? Right. 
So when you tell your friends how much money you're making in the markets, right, you're giving up your day job to go and uh, to go and trade stocks. OK, that is one of the warning signs. We're not talking about what you guys are doing out there because you're committed to being a long term trader. These are the short term guys who have just jumped into the market right now, bought something without any idea what they're doing. And all of a sudden it goes up. They think they're geniuses. It's amazing how markets can make a lot of people very look very clever on the way up. Right. You know, when you start counting your money and figuring out how early you're going to retire or how um, <laughs> or or how you can go about spending it um, uh, or how your wife, in some cases, could go about spending it. Uh, those are sort of some of the indicators that you might want to think about. Right. So, look. I've got a couple of others that we can sit here and look at. I think um, uh, for me, I just really wanted to highlight uh, highlight what we're seeing. What we're seeing. So there's another stage after this, right? So what tends to happen after this is we go into a couple of um, technical breakdowns. So have we begun to see those in the stock market? Well, time will tell. But as markets roll over, they take their time. Tops and stock markets always take a long time. Bottoms are always set very quickly. And as we do this, and as we as we roll over, you will go through various stages of disbelief. Everybody out there will tell you it's just another correction, and it's still time to buy. And what happens is you end up adding to your positions, the market keeps falling. So like I said, guys, I have no idea when, where or how, but my sense is from here on in, we probably shouldn't be buying new highs, we should be thinking about the opposite approach. Uh, but I don't know what that time frame is going to look like. And I highly doubt it's going to be this year, it could end up being um, the beginning of next. And that's it for me, Paul. Cheers, Julian. Thank you very much. Always fascinating to have a look at sentiment and markets, certainly, as you say, uh, stock markets in particular, at a key moment. And uh, one of those moments, I think, where um, one of the strange things that happens in trading, when you look back three or four months from now, whatever happens, I think people go, that was pretty obvious. Uh, and I think either way it goes, you've got to make a case that it was, was quite seeable. So let's let's keep an eye on it. Let's let it, let it play out. Let's say the tops uh, take a bit longer to, to, to play out. So let's let it play out and get this picture really, really clear for us. It's time for us to uh, have a look at uh, fundamentals with Alexis. Um, we have finished uh, sentiment. We're going to have a look at fundamentals. After that, we're going to have a chat with Ash about data. Thank you, Julian. Alexis, um, what are the fundamentals telling us this week? Where should we, hit? What, where should we be heading? Well, I think it was uh, really um, great that Julian actually shared the sentiment cycle. So I was kind of out of touch uh, with the market for a bit. And what I did the first thing to, when I got back to charts was really to look at the sentiment cycle and see where things are at. And coincidentally, I've, I'm not best at it, but I'm trying to figure it out. So I'm just going to share what I found. Um, anyway, the, you, the British pound, I think there's a good chance that they are looking at increasing interest rates. And then if you look at the news across uh, the US, you know, it's going to be like, 50-50. And when I say 50-50, it's mainly because uh, US banks, right? The US banks are actually taking diverging bets on the direction of interest, interest rates. So I'm going to share the article and um, to give you a little bit of a sensing of uh, where it's going. Let me just uh, share screen here. Okay, so over here. All right, so um, one thing that that came out was when, when I saw this article where they were talking about the investors um, crank up bets on U UK interest rate rises. It's a question of um, what's happening in the UK and will they, will they be the ones to actually do an in interest rate hike ahead, ahead of the US, right? And when we look at the news coming up from the US, the question would be, so where exactly are they going? Are they going to increase interest rates? Are they going to hold it? interest rates, where as it goes. And the, the messaging, I think, is very clear when you have the big banks taking diverging bets on interest rates, meaning nobody knows, right? So there is not very great clarity on, on where interest rates are going. And it's, it shows in um, the, the debt portfolio of the major US banks. So over here, it just tells you uh, which banks are holding more treasuries, which banks are holding less treasuries and who's buying more, who's buying less. So it's a very clear signal that, you know, as of now, it is still very uncertain in terms of where the US dollar is going to, is going to go in terms of interest rates. So when we look again on um, this article, and they're talking about the, the, the Bank of England is moving towards more of a um, increasing interest rates to combat their inflation. The question then will be, will there be a better opportunity trading the pound? So what I'm doing is I'm actually looking more on the pound in the next couple of weeks until a little bit more clarity comes in. And when we look at the, um, 
the how you say the statistics for for the pound, right? Uh, let me just flash flash the stats for for the pound. So trading economics again is a very easy way to look at it. So over here, the UK, you can see that the infl inflation rate is currently at 3.2%. I mean, if you compare this to the US of 5.4, it doesn't seem um, a, fan, a, a very big problem. But I think if you see the increase, so what the, the government in the UK is probably spooked by is like, you know, there is a sudden hike of um, 1.2 percent inflation right so it's like suddenly it's it's a uh, inflation is going up and then it might is it a, then a knee-jerk reaction to kind of uh, work on interest rates if you compare the u.s inflation rate i think the one thing that we can see is actually holding steady so it's not getting higher at least so i don't think there's a, a lot of urgency in terms of uh, it changing interest rates because it's kind of holding steady. So I think the, the urgency uh, might be a little bit more in the UK and that is why um, they're contemplating on, okay, is this is this time, you know, to, to combat inflation or, you know, are we good to just hold it? So, of course, uh, that brings us down to what can we trade in the next couple of weeks and I really am interested in uh, the pound, the pound pairs. So uh, first, I'm going to share the other pound pairs um, on the, and just look at the level. So when we talk about uh, implementing a little bit of fundamentals into, into trading the actual currencies, it's always good to see a, a bigger picture, right? So when I go through the pound pairs, what I am looking for is, um, just let me just go out to the weekly time frame first, is just to see what levels are they at and what is the impact of a potential increase in interest rates might do. So pound Swiss, I would say it's not very clear, not much clarity. If you look at pound Aussie on the weekly time frame, again, um, it is interesting. Pound Aussie actually is interesting on the daily time frame. Let me just get a bit of a ratio of this chart. All right, it is interesting because it seems to be testing a you know resistance turn support at this area. So this is a daily time frame. So if the pound were to increase its uh, interest interest rates, does that mean uh, we will see a push? from one of these levels over here, will there be an increase in the, the value of the pound currency, right? So if you talk about textbook economics, I mean, if you just um, very simple definition, right? If all factors being equal, okay, all economic factors being equal, higher interest rates in one country potentially increases the value of that country's uh, currency relative to other nations offering lower interest rates. So this is like a textbook definition. So if we just throw everything aside, textbook definition, if interest rates increase for the pound, will there be a higher probability that price will find support at this level and head up? So that is um, the question that I am looking for a lot of the pound pairs. And if we look at pound yen, let me zoom in a little bit. And we look at pound yen, the question would be again over here, it seems to be, it seems to have broken a, a resistance level. So the question would be, all right, so if it's broken a resistance level, will that will price then come back, retest this line and, and find that, you know, find that push that it needs with this potential um, uh, interest rate hike, right? So it's about, it's, I'm looking at the probabilities of, okay, where is the, where is it? Tend tending to go to in terms of fundamentals and using the technicals kind of help me find a way in. Um, pound cat is a bit more interesting because it's a pretty decent support level over here on the daily time frame. If we shift out on a weekly time frame, then it is a curious thing as okay, it's it's a it's it is at an interesting level, right? I mean, it is price has been bouncing off this area. You know, will the pound? go upwards. So yes, I'm a bit leaning towards a bullish pound based on you know the, the fundamentals coming up and the technical levels is at. And what I'm looking for is which currency pair in comparison will give me a best boost to it. On top of that, uh, let's talk about a bit of sentiment cycle. And uh, based on what Julian was saying just now, now, I'm not an expert in sentiment cycle. What I've just did was um, I actually have a picture of the sentiment cycle that I put uh, on my, on my uh, on my trading screen when I'm kind of figuring out where price is going. So I'm just going to do this. So my question is I'm drawing arrows at what I think where they are, like just by trying to recognize the pattern. And again, pound dollar, the question I have for myself is, is this the support of level, support level that we're looking at for price to bounce up? Is this that, you know, uh, according to the sentiment cycle, is this that anxiety level? Uh, are we near a, a so-called denial level? So I'm a little bit bullish the pound, 
you know, a little bit, I'm, a, I'm more bullish the pound in terms of where it's at on a technical level and also, um, also in the potential interest of the interest rates actually moving up, you know, and it seems to be a lot of talk about it. And if the interest rates really move ahead of the US, all right, it will, it will be quite a big jump, I feel, because, um, you know, usually every country is actually waiting for the US to move first. So if the pound takes that first step, I think the market will find a push at least to one side or the other. So I'm using these technical levels to help, kind of help me find um, what are the probabilities of where to find our entries in. All right. So that's it for me. I'm looking for the pound for the next couple of weeks until there is a, you know, until the actual interest rate actually pops out. But I'm looking for the moves to be kind of priced in for traders to be kind of looking a little bit more towards a bullish direction. And we'll see where that goes. Thank you, Paul. Cheers, Alexis. Uh, thank you very much. Always good uh, to get a bit of an understanding on fundamentals and that direct link to inflation and interest rates seems pretty clear. We will watch that with a lot of interest. Thanks, Alexis. Next up, we're going to go to Ash and uh, talk uh, data. And following that, we're going to do uh, through our commodities. We're going to have a look at gold, uh, Bitcoin or crypto and, um, and oil. But first of all, Ash, how's the season it's looking at the moment? Well, I think uh, if we have a quick look through the seasonals, the, the major currency seasonals, and, and get a, a general feel of which currency tends to uh, do the best at this particular time of year. The uh, the Aussie the Aussie looks to me like it's uh, it gets a pretty good rally um, uh, throughout most of October, but then it starts to dip towards the end. We might be getting like relatively near that to that particular point now, um, and then it gets a little bit choppy. And, and really, what I'd like to see if I'm if I'm looking at seasonals. I'd really like to see a period more like uh, this, where you, you see a low uh, uh, form at a certain time of uh, the year, and then you see in the same run the high, uh, rather than kind of looking at this, where it, it kind of gets a, a little bit sticky. If, it, according to this, it would suggest that really the, the, the top in uh, the Australian dollar is sometime in November, but you might kind of have to uh, live through a little bit of choppy price action towards the end of October. So we could still be holding on to the Australian dollar. That, that looks pretty good. Uh, you know, the cot date that we've seen uh, relatively recently has been pretty bullish on the, uh, the Australian dollar. Looking at the pound, um, I, I quite like this. You know, the, the pound does actually extend right the way through and, and this stops in December, but then we'd, we'd go into here and we'd see it uh, rally right the way up until February. February. So, uh, you know, I, I'd be relatively supportive of, uh, of what Lexi is saying. We did see a, a pretty good boost with the pound uh, towards the end of last week. And I think that was on, on some uh, interest rate, um, interest rate, prob uh, interest rate uh, um, speculation. Uh, it, it's still got a long way to go. You know, interest rates are, are currently at 0.1%. And I think that they, they're effectively, you know, speculators are, are looking for the United Kingdom to possibly even raise interest rates before the United States. I think the fact that they are in the conversation is enough for us to say, uh, looking for shorts in the pound and the dollar with, a, with an extended move, um, maybe not the best uh, and safest way to play it, whether we, 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 we actually bet on the fact that they are going to raise interest rates is another question. But I think we can we can probably put it in the back pocket and say, OK, we, we probably don't need to be too bearish on the on the pound and, uh, and the dollar in the, in the coming weeks. But what we could look to be bearish on is the yen. Um, I would say there's pretty much no chance. I, you know, you, you can uh, never say never, if you like, when you're looking at currencies or when, when you're looking at trading. But I'd say the chances are incredibly slim that the yen are going to go anywhere near uh, interest rate hikes or even, even monetary tightening. You know, it's, I think it's going to be very, very difficult for, uh, for the Japanese economy to do that. And this is the, the, the kind of um, seasonality pattern that we really like to see. So the yen, sometime around uh, October, mid-October, <clears throat> we see a big, big dip and, and very few pullbacks, really, right the way through to, um, to that around about the middle of December. So November looks like an incredibly bearish month, turn in October, maybe another turn to the upside um, in, uh, in December. But looks like we're heading for a, a pretty good period here. For, uh, for the yen. And as I say, that would be backed up with um, with some of the fundamental data as well, if we're going on the bet of who's likely to change interest rates first. And we are in that particular period. 
You know, sometimes you look at the, the, the data and, and it's more to do with who's got the best purchasing power with the current um, uh, financial conditions. But we're sort of in a different era now because we are now talking about some countries tightening, some countries possibly even talking about interest rate hikes going into next year. What do the other countries do when uh, some of the majors uh, start to change their policy? You know, do they, do they stand still or do they try and keep up? So the yen looks like a, a pretty good, um, a pretty good signal uh, seasonally for some downside. Um, and the other one I'd, I'd probably uh, like to bring our attention to is the uh, is the euro, but I'm not sure. Oh well, let's look at the dollar index because the euro is is made up of um, most of the dollar index. The dollar index is is um, mostly made up and calculated from uh, the euro. So when we look at the uh, the dollar index again, pretty good run to the upside uh, on the dollar throughout uh, around about the middle of October, right the way through to the middle of November. So looks like and and you know back to the fundamentals. Europe very similar to Japan. Uh, the likelihood that they are going to move and be one of the first movers, I would suggest, is pretty slim. So, um, so bringing those factors into play, you look at the US dollar on on the seasonals uh, with a with a with a probability that we might see some tightening. Um, looks pretty good for upside, suggesting euro downside. You look at the yen from what we've just seen from the seasonals, very very weak, and and the weakest signal of all. Uh, moving to the downside and you know bringing that uh, that uh, um, monetary policy back into the argument and, and the discussion suggests that they're probably unlikely to move as well. So looks like do dollar looks pretty good for some upside. Yen looks pretty good for some downside along with the euro and uh, and some of the other markets. You know I, I certainly wouldn't go against the pound right now. Cheers, Ash. Thanks for that. Uh, much appreciated. Another look at the data, the seasonal chart. So. It does look to me as if um, most things are doing something seasonally over the next six to eight weeks. It's a nice period for seasons where not much is going sideways. There's, there's some action on most of them. Yeah, I think so, mate. And, and, and because we are in that uh, in that discussion phase of monetary policy, you know, it's not quiet anymore, is it? We've had the boom. We, we are we are starting to see the the um, the um, um, result of some of the price points and some of the supply chain issues. We know all about that stuff. Europe is still, Lagarde is still calling for inflation to be transitory. That's not pretty, that's not, that's not bullish, that's not um, bullish language. You know, that, that's, she's basically saying, oh yeah, we're okay, we can do nothing here. Um, so, uh, so that, you know, the seasonals look like they might actually start to play out. Right, um, Moose is asking a quick look at the uh, seasonals on, on the Kiwi. Do you have the seasonals on the Kiwi? Yeah, sure thing. Yeah, no, we, we have uh, also seen um, uh, New Zealand move. Looks a little bit choppy. You know, it, look, it looks pretty wild, actually. Generally speaking, up. You know, if you're looking at the general direction, it looks up. But it looks looks wild. Um, and if you were just saying, you know, let, let's just uh, focus on the seasonals, you would, uh, you'd want to be pretty... Um, pretty accurate with your entries in accordance to this particular chart here. Um, but, uh, but generally speaking, yes, up, but uh, not as smooth as what we, what we tend to see in May. You know, this seems like a pretty wild period coming up. Nice, mate. Yeah, that may, uh, that major line movement in New Zealand dollars are a ripper. Cheers, Ash. Thank you very much for that. We'll see you again uh, next uh, Sunday. If anyone else wants to have any information on uh, cot or seasonals, uh, they're able to join the Market Edge broadcast group and just contact the company if they want to do that and have daily updates from Ash on the stuff. Radio, next time it is now, it's time to go and look at commodities. We're going to start off with gold. Um, Ainsley, are you with us? I certainly am. Paul, how are you? I'm good, thanks. How are you? Oh, we're very excited over here in Sydney. You guys are getting out, aren't you? You and Melbourne both getting out. Oh, gosh, what happened on we're Friday, Ainsley? We've been out. We've been out. In fact, I went down to pick up the pizza on Friday night. And the place was just heaving. So it's just like, what pandemic? But anyway, um, it's good to see, see things getting back to, <laughs> to normal again, including children going off to school tomorrow. Gosh, uh, this gold market's frustrating, isn't it, Ainsley? Just when you think it's on the way back, it comes smashing down to the top of the range. Look, we did promise a little bit of chop coming into October. And yeah. look, what can I say? It has delivered. Yeah, in, in spades. It's just, it's been a nightmare, I've got to say, Paul. It is really, uh, really something else trading gold. I mean, here we have the FOMC. You can see my 4 alley chart. Uh, we thought that we've got some more talk about uh, inflation and there were a bit of, bit, bit of the jitters. And you've got to say, bit of the jitters. Oh, she flew. And then it just, by 
that was Thursday. Then Friday, Friday, we have really good US retail prices coming out and it got very nervous and Treasury yields decided that they'd bounce back from this information and it just came straight back down again. Now, you could be very cynical and say, but at least we, at least we ended up north um, uh, of, of where we started at the beginning of the week, like half a percent, which is just, but this is really, it's, it's, it's very disappointing to trade, let me tell you. Um, I've got to say, when you look at it on the daily, yes, you could have said very easily, we've just gone straight into the 200 simple moving average, which is something that the that goal will react to. It, it comes anywhere near the 200 simple moving average on a daily chart. It does get very thingy, gets very touchy around that price point. Uh, I did expect um, a bit of a reaction, but here we are back down into this level. And if I just whack on a horizontal line, at where where it sort of came down and touched. Okay, uh, you can see this is. Oh, let's just pull it down a little bit more. It's just one of those areas that it over the last from from the last six months since since we had that sell off, it just keeps coming back. It just goes up, doesn't go any higher than eighteen thirty, goes down, then comes back into this middle area. It's just consolidating, but. The C I know we haven't actually followed clearly any seasonal charts or even the COT data. I, and I know that um, Ash and I have been comparing some of the COT data on on uh, during midweek and we're just saying, well, it did say this and it should, should have been going this way. It doesn't seem to be complying with that. Having said that, the seasonals for the next six weeks is for CHOP. And CHOP we have done. So at the moment, um, gold is not giving me any, any warm fuzzies at all going forward at the moment. I, I've got to say, I'm just going to sit and wait and see uh, where we're going to end up by the end of November. So that's it for me on gold at the moment. It's not my, favorite, not my favorite commodity at all. That is uh, just part of being a trader, isn't it? Sometimes you just got to wait and wait for the good opportunity. And let's be honest, that uh, December, January, February, March, yeah. uh, seasonal on gold, uh, uh, no election year this year. Hopefully, it'll swing back in and uh, take us yeah. back to what we're used to. Fingers crossed. Right here, next up, we have got uh, cryptocurrencies with Sukri. Sukri can't be in life. We do have a recording from him. And Mai's going to jump in now and play the recording from Sukri. Thanks, Mai. Okay, hello, guys. So, Bitcoin is up, Ethereum rushes up. And why is this so? Because the day of reckoning has come. We got not one, but two ETFs, okay, from Valkyrie and ProShares. Very, very famous, uh, actually, ETFs company. And uh, look at that to be listed on the New York Stock Exchange, ARCA. This is the Bitcoin ProShares, Bitcoin strategy. The other one is what? Uh, Valkyrie, right? So this is superb. This is superb. And uh, we're now hitting the highs again of Bitcoin here. Let's look at this. Okay, we're about to challenge the new highs. Didn't go there. It would be good if it come, goes up here, tries to challenge, comes back, uh, make a support around this area, 60, and then we can safely go up again. Same two for Ethereum. However, I'm quite frustrated that Ethereum also has not even hit that trend line. When are you going, Ethereum? What is happening to you? not doing anything yeah if it hits here and tries to rechallenge all time it also be good and then find support along this line now uh these are good days but please be careful of a correction i don't know how big it is but i think an imminent correction is coming because of this if we look at the crypto fear and greed index people are now because bitcoin is moving right and and the difference now than in may is that the hodlers are holding because there's so many ETFs that are coming. Extreme greed is now at 79. But look at this. This was when we had market was smashed. So, you know, this was when the market was smashed, right? In April, this was when the market was smashed in May. So we are going on dangerous territory. But regardless of the territory, one coin that is really pushing up is Polkadot because there are crowd loans. There's it's going to start on uh, November 11th. You know, my main ones will be, of course, Moonbeam. 
Ectoplasm and Akala, you mentioned by Gavin Wood. And the smaller ones would be Kilt and probably my favorite, Manta Network. Okay, so uh, that's it for today, guys. And let's look before I go. Yeah, the dominance is 44.4. That's okay because as Bitcoin goes up, look at down here, it's pulling up everyone else. I'm going to see you guys next week. Cheers, uh, Shoki, very, very much for the uh, the overview and a look at Bitcoin today. Now, Ainsley, time to look at oil. If uh, gold has been frustrating, oil continues to ramp on up, and all of a sudden, that hundred dollar. I've been ninety ninety five all year. Now I'm starting to think maybe we're going to hundred here. Look, um, I think with a, we've got a lot of recovery, uh, recovering economies here, and uh, we're Northern Hemisphere winter approaching. I look, you're trying to find some reasons why. Oil should come back in price at the moment, and there just aren't any. I think the Saudis are very happy at the moment where it all is. Uh, Vladimir Putin certainly is. Um, there was some pressure. There's been a request from the US to actually bring the price down, to increase the supply in order to bring the price down, not necessarily to reduce them. There's, there is no reduction in demand. So when you've got supply it's, um, not equaling demand and demand exceeding supply, you have an upward pressure on prices. Prices are now where, as you can see, they closed on Friday, right smack bang on, S, on R2, on resistance level on the monthly pivot. So we've got that happening. But look where it's gone. It's gone from, turned around from the 20th of August, straight back up. And it's barely missed a beat. I mean, we had a little bit of a pullback and, and those are sensitive it was sensitive to um, Putin announcements and where he was going to do all sorts of things. But, you know, he didn't quite come through there. They were trying to keep the natural gas price down as well, uh, but that's just to no avail. We, uh, You're right, Paul, we were talking about 1995, probably 100 with... Economies, and I know from from our point of view, Australia has just opened up quite. Uh, we've opened up New South Wales. International borders will be open from the first of November. That means because it takes a long, any flight from Australia is a is a long flight, except for New Zealand, obviously. But um, they're talking about US, UK, fast lane with Singapore. They're talking about all these things coming on board. Qantas is just about chomping at the bit. Singapore Airlines has thrown on 32,000. Tickets went on sale last night. Apparently most of those have gone, um, just with people trying to get home. So that is demand. It, it, when you've got that kind of demand building up on top of, as I said, Northern Hemisphere winter, there is no there is no pullback. So I think we're going to keep it keep seeing the upward trend going, which is a good thing. Cheers, Ainsley. Thanks for that. It's nice to have one of them trending when the other one doesn't. You've got a couple of products right. to have a look at. It is a really cool thing. So great to see oil continuing to rally, even while gold goes a little bit sideways for us. Look, I hope you're getting a lot out of this. And uh, if you're watching us in one block, you've had a chance to have a look at Julian doing sentiment, uh, Alexis doing um, fundamentals. We've had Ashen doing um, doing data. We've had Ainsley doing gold. We've had uh, Shukri doing crypto. We've got Ainsley back and doing oil. Three to go. We've still got um, in a few minutes. We've got a lawyer through currency strength. Then we've got a Gordon to do uh, US stocks, and after that, we'll go to Jeff to get the technical overview of the whole thing. As a trader, I hope all of this information together is uh, providing for you a clearer and clearer picture of the week that uh, lies ahead for you. Rightio, if you are in, um, if you're on uh, Facebook, if you're on uh, YouTube, and you have any questions, put them in the questions box, and uh, Ma will get them to us. And if you are live in the Zoom, just put them in the Zoom box, and we will get to you. As I said, uh, next up, we're going to go to Lloyd and talk. Uh, Cast strength index. Lloyd, are you ready? Yep, here I am. So let's jump into the screens. All right. So first of all, uh, last the last two, no, last week, the trades that I took, first of all, was that pound switch wasn't triggered. Uh, it was actually looking to short pound, but it went below the trend line, the horizontal level. There wasn't any price to set up for me. So I have to let that go. Now, on the other hand, dollar yen did have a setup for me. I was looking for a price to actually bounce off this horizontal level. It did not, in fact, give me a higher low. Was happy to take that. Uh, so I'm in the middle of this trade now. Uh, just should be shifting. I've shifted my stop loss to break even here. You wonder where that takes me. Now, a little bit of bonus, which I did an analysis for silver two weeks back. Yeah, I was seeing this happening. So this actually happened in the past back 
than the thing before. Twenty eighteen was uh, jokingly called the Batman Veteran Patterns. But uh, just to update you all that actually I have actually got into these tricks. Yeah, so for any of you who actually got into it, I don't think it's too late to get into these tricks. Uh, price might still be bouncing off the significant high. Uh, just need to keep a lookout for any relevant price action to jump in. Now, as a note, I will I'll be in this for the long run, and I'm actually aiming for a take profit off at the twenty-eight dollars level. Yeah, so this will easily give me more than a ten is to one risk to one return. So I'll see whether that actually plays out. Yeah. So this is a bit of a bonus uh, trick, uh, which I actually did the analysis to expect. Now for this current week, let's have a look at the currency indices. The Canadian index is really bullish. Yeah, so it has broke past the eighty dollars. I think uh, thanks to the recent oil or was it gas rally so as such i've upgraded it uh, this would be my most bullish uh, currency to trade in upcoming a hit now the british currency price is still bouncing off very, very nicely uh i was expecting a downtrend from this level but it did not so it actually bounced off this horizontal level so as such uh, my suspicion is that it might be in this range for quite a bit more yeah so we'll be doing a bit of a range trading for how pairs if possible yeah, so aiming for 142 at the previous significant high, that's, you know, I'll take back my word, possibly aiming at 140. Let's not be too aggressive because this is still a very significant horizontal level. Yeah, so I'm pretty bullish about CAT and how. Now the next is out on my list will be Swiss. Overall Swiss is, I was, I'm still seeing it as a, a sort of a weakening currency overall, but it does, uh, similar analysis as last week, it still have room to move back up to the high of the channel or the horizontal level. Yeah, so I'll see this as a retracement move more than a trend mode. Now dollar index as of now, I'm a bit uh, unsure about it. Yeah, no doubt it did broke above the horizontal level, but for the past two weeks, it has been showing some hesitation to move any higher. Yes, yeah, so I'm putting it in the middle of my list, uh, possibly not touching it. Same as Euro, <coughs> a bit of a hesitation around here, what didn't perform as bullish as a water, I might actually retrace back to the horizontal level, uh, but again, it's in the middle of my list. I'd rather not touch it since I'm not very, very clear where it wants to go. Now for the commodity uh, currencies, which, which is the Aussie and the Kiwi. Now Aussie is, the Aussie currency is a bit odd to me at the moment, weird to me at the moment. Uh, definitely, I still see it as being in a uh, selling momentum, but it seems to be reaching for a, either a double top or even the horizontal level. Now, again, anything which I'm unsure of, I'd rather not touch it. Unlike the TV, which is much more clear to me, uh, much more inclined to actually short the TV because price is still in the downward channel, very beautiful. Yeah, in fact, it's at the high of the channel, so I'm looking actually to actually short it in the upcoming week ahead. Now, the, I think other has really others has really pointed it out. The yen is actually the most uh, bearish for me, so no reason to turn away from it. As such, for the upcoming hit, I'm going to pair to trade attempt to trade cat yen long. Yeah, price can either actually retrace back to the trend line or the horizontal level, whichever it is. I'm happy to actually jump it in if I have a relevant price action, and the next will be actually Kiwi Swiss. Yeah, so I'm waiting for price to actually form a double top. Uh, that will if it gives me a very, very nice bearish bar, I'll straight away jump in. Otherwise, I will always wait for the break and retest of the Kiwi Swiss in the four hour time frame. Yep, so that's all for my analysis for this coming week. Thanks, Lloyd, and uh, we will now go uh, straight. We've got, uh, thank you very much for that. Always interesting analysis. I always look forward to this part. Of, there's lots of good stuff. I always look forward to this part. Always interesting to see what's happening with the currency strength indexes. We're going to go now and talk US stocks with Gordon Scott. Gordon can't be in live because of the time of uh, session in, uh, in the US, but he sent us a recording for this week. Looking forward to this very much. We've got Gordon to go on US stocks and Jeff to go on technical analysis. What do you got for us, uh, Maya? Can I play Gordon's video? Hey everybody, just a weekend update on what I'm seeing in the markets. I want to start right here with this chart, which shows you how the U.S. markets closed on Friday. All of them sporting a little bit of an uptrend, a pattern of higher highs and higher lows. Curiously, the Russell 2000, the small cap index, uh, pushed out of that, you know, into the new high and then back uh, down into the uh, trend, upward trend range. So that's the exception that there was more selling than, than buying uh, 
on on a sort of risky area but all of the others had buyers pushing up to new highs so the u.s markets finished the week on a very positive note and they're likely to carry that on into the next week not only because i'm looking at this chart but also because my favorite correlation between stocks and currencies is the aussie yen and the nasdaq 100 and i'm looking at this and you can see the, there, there's the both of them. The futures are in the green line on the top. The, the blue line is the Aussie yen. And then the blue shape down below is the correlation, the, the three month look back correlation of the two. You can see that in the past, there's been pretty strongly positively correlated. That's kind of normal. There are periods of times where that kind of goes out of phase. And we've had one over the past few months, especially most recently here, just over the summer, it's gone, uh, you know, counter. Uh, trend. So NASDAQ keeps going up while Aussie Yen keeps going down or vice versa. And we saw that the past three weeks where the markets right in front of the US Open, the Aussie Yen was uh, trending higher and the NASDAQ was trending lower. And just now we've started to see that they're retracking and, and following together. And you can see this line coming up means that uh, they're they're moving back out of counter correlation and into sort of a, a random situation where they are now the the question is will they trend and get back into you know fully heading up that will happen if the US markets are bullish and you know continue to stay that way and i think that at least um for a little period of time they may have some sort of back and forth conflict about it uh, but but we'll eventually get there. Now, while they're having that camp conflict, check out this comparison. This is the Australian dollar and uh, the Australian dollar paired with the U.S. dollar compared to just the DXY, the U.S. dollar index. And, and notice on a long-term trend, the correlation is a very, um, uh, uh, you know, counter uh, negative correlation, right? In other words, if the Aussie yen's going up, the U.S. dollar index is going down and vice versa. Okay. And that's the Aussie yen, not, not so much the Aussie yen all by itself, but the Aussie yen paired with the U.S. dollar. I mean, that's just a mathematical thing because the dollar's on the other side. So, of course, what's weird is they're not 100% all the time, right? Because if that's what the, the setup is, the Aussie, you know, buy the Aussie, sell the U.S. dollar, they should be 100% negatively correlated all the time. But they're not. There are these periods where they run up and make this peak and then come back down and get back to their normal negative correlation. Well, right now we're on a bit of a move where we're heading up. And I'm thinking that what's going to happen here is it's, you know, we're probably not going to see the exact same height of it, but it'll come to some measure of peak and then turn around and get back to normal. When this happened last time, notice here the dollar was on the rise. The dollar index all by itself was on the rise. Uh, Aussie N was on the decline, and that peak marked the moment where it turned around. I think that we're close to a thing like that now. So what, what that means, you see, what we've, we've already kind of started the pattern here where the Aussie N could begin gaining strength and the dollar could begin falling back down. Now, um, there, uh, there's a lot of inflation concern out there in the U.S. Uh, dollar and, and, you know, concern about things priced in U.S. dollars uh, going up. And um, so it's kind of weird that the dollar index is showing strength because if everybody's worried about inflation, you'd think that dollar index should be weak, right? Well, I, th I think that's coming. I think that this uh, whole upward trend here and downward trend there is about to reverse. And if that reverses, well, then there's a good chance that we could see a couple of interesting things take place, uh, one of which would be um, opportunities on the Aussie, uh, the, the Aussie Australian dollar all by itself in both, uh, compared to the US dollar as well as other pairs, specifically the euro. Let me show you what I mean. So in this chart, we see where this is the daily of the euro and the Australian dollar. And see, it had been an upward trend, meaning the euro was strong. Euro failed to make a new high broke the trend line and has had a steep downward move so that's a strong move the question is is that gonna is that gonna rebound because if the dollar is gonna start getting weak the euro might get strong right 
except what if the Australian dollar gets stronger? You know, and if both the euro and the Australian dollar are going to get strong in comparison to the US dollar, which one is going to get stronger? Quite possibly the Australian dollar, which would mean that this break of a trend is just the beginning. There could be a long downward uh, trend for the Euro Aussie, at least another 100 pips just to get started, right? But let's look at the four hour chart and you'll see what I mean here. We've had this big move down of the four hour chart. And so now if you look at the uh, commodity channel index indicator, which is the best one for picking up um, early indications of uh, divergence, right? Now divergence, uh, a lot of people are like, oh, a divergence, that means it's a big turnaround the other way. No, no, it's it's not guaranteed. In fact, uh, it's, it's little better than random whether it plays out. But that's not why you look at divergence, you know, to get predictability. Well, the reason you look at divergence is because there's a small window where you could take a shot and whichever way it breaks, it could be a lot bigger payoff, right? So you could have a 50-50 trade but the payoff is bigger than 50-50, depending on which way it goes. I mean, not, not depending, do, depending on whether you are on the right side of it or not, right? So how do you get on the right side? Well, it's pretty simple. You either watch this red line and play the downside, or you watch the green line and play the upside. The average true range of the Euro Aussie on a four hour chart is about 40 pips. It's like 37 and, and uh, change. So uh, about 40 pips is all the stop loss you need to give it. So whichever way it breaks, you you enter that way and then you, you have a 40 pip stop loss, let it do its thing and look for a 100 pip move in your favor, either up or down. Um, as for US stocks, I think n starting next week, it's possible that it's going to be a good time to buy. But I I don't think it's just going to go straight up and keep going. I think it's going to turn around, have a little bit of weakness, and there's going to be some good buying opportunities, and it's going to it's going to come up. If if that happens, then what I think you see is that um, the euro will will break up. The question is, will it break up strong enough to you know break this trend line? Right. If not, if if when it breaks up, it it just kind of hits resistance or, or fails to you know get above this old uh, high right here, then I think what you'll see is is that it's going to come down and continue uh, continue lower. And you, you could be looking at a target of 1.55 on the Euro Aussie. So anyway, that's my read for the weekend. And um, uh, we'll, we'll try it again next week and see how it comes out. But if you're interested in what's going to happen in, just as the U.S. stock market opens on Monday morning, morning New York time, then uh, show up and we'll talk about what stock to trade. Cheers. So Gordon there talking about his uh, Monday night Singapore uh, YouTube show, uh, which uh, social media shows you can go live on Zoom or into social media. What stock to trade live and now also looks at Forex and crypto in that uh, show for you guys. So Plenty of interesting stuff there that Aussie, Euro Aussie uh, traders will be having a bit of a look at tomorrow morning. It's on my list. Jeff, it's been a long show, mate. Nice to have the whole team in. A few, few recordings. But nice to have everybody in one way or another. It's been a, been a nice long show, right? Yeah, mate, yeah, out of uh, football final season and into that little, I don't know, it's like a hiatus, isn't it, between rugby league and cricket? Mate, oh, sorry, rug rugby night, union and cricket. Saturday night, no no work, no crypto coin stuff to go, and no All Blacks to watch. I mean, really and truly, I had to watch, I had to watch a movie on TV with my wife. I don't know what's going on. Um, mate, uh, let's talk uh, technicals, though. We've had a look at everything else, and now it's time to have a look at what the technicals are telling us so we can set ourselves up really nicely for next week. And look, if you're looking, if you're watching the show, often what we're looking for is we're looking to use some of the stuff early in the show for directions and technicals for timing. That's what I tend to do anyway. Jeff, what do you got for us technically this week? Yeah, look, very interesting to hear Gordon's take on uh, the Aussie. And I, I think the Aussie is pretty much the flavour of the month. Trick is, as you say, the timing of getting into that. I'm looking at, uh, and, and I will talk a bit, little bit about Euro Aussie, which Gordon was talking about just now. That'll be my final thing. But the first thing I look at uh, on Sundays is where we get what I call game change bars. Now, I've, I haven't really got, well, I've got one. 
which surprises me a little bit. But we'll have a look at that in just a tick. The first is uh, Aussie CAD. Now, I'm a, I'm a great CAD fan, I've got to say, but I'm also on the side of the Aussie at the moment, not because I live in Australia, but because of um, exactly what we have to offer in terms of uh, commodities in particular, and commodities seem to be the flavour of the month, and therefore so does the Aussie. So when I look at this chart, Aussie CAD, uh, and yes, I do understand that oil is going that away, and that tends to drag the CAD with it, but technically... That's what are we talking about. And technically, we're at the bottom of range here on Aussie CAD. But if we go a little bit wider, you can see that that range is quite significant because of the previous support at this level, which is around about 190, 145, as I've got it, represents. If you want to be, mm, I won't say abstract, but I will say um, creative. You can probably see a left shoulder here and a head and a right shoulder as well. So I'm very much of the opinion that we're going to see this week. That's a monthly chart I'm looking at, by the way. That becomes the weekly chart now, which has created that game changer bar, as I see, as I said, which indicates to me that we're going to go higher this week. And that's what I'll be looking for. So daily chart, I need to see something a little bit clearer than what I'm seeing at the moment despite the fact that we have had a clear break of the resistance trend line and a failure to go below that. But I still think there's a little bit left in this in terms of downside before I can see a clear higher low. Once I do see that on a daily or four hour chart, I will be looking to trade this long and the target will be somewhere up around the 93, high 93s, somewhere up here somewhere. So that's um, Aussie CAD. That's the first of our game changer bars. The second of our game changer bars, which is the, the one that's secret, secretly um, surprising to me, is this one, Aussie Kiwi. Not, not that I didn't expect the Kiwi to rally, because you'd have to expect the Kiwi to rally, given that we now have uh, an interest rate differential um, that's very, very clear between the Aussie and the Kiwi, but between the, uh, the Kiwi, sorry, and just about every other currency pair. So you would expect the Kiwi to rally. The strength of that rally and the length of that rally is the question. And here I see something that's very, very interesting. What we have on the weekly chart is a clear rejection of the weekly trend line. We've got a clear rejection of this horizontal level. 105, 60 odd. But then I go to the monthly chart and I see a game changer bar on that chart. This one is really, really interesting to me. And if I go a little bit wider still, I see a clear base. And the latest of that base is a double bottom. And now I've got a clear higher low. So this one's really confusing. Um, I've, I've got to say, I'd have to go with the game changer bar for the week and trade it down to the monthly pivot. So I think that's probably the way I would look to go in, in the short term. I don't want to trade that bar, uh, but I would like to see a pullback on a daily chart, uh, maybe back to last week's weekly pivot or these highs back here, something like that. Whether we'll see that or not, given that momentum, I'm not 100% sure, but I think that's the way to go in the short term. Aussie Kiwi is short, but once it gets to that level, I think I'll be looking to trade it long because we do have a clear double bottom here and that higher low on the monthly chart gives me the indication this is actually going long in the, uh, in the medium to long term. Euro dollar. Now, there's a lot of uh, conjecture about euro dollar. Uh, this is not... Uh, something that I'm really keen to to, to look at because I'm a, a massive um, a massive person that it, it, well I, I hate the US dollar I think it's junk really and and doesn't deserve its status in the world but that said we have a very very clear picture here in my opinion that says we are at a support level on euro US dollar. We've tried to break out of that level. We failed. We've tried to break out of that level. Are we going to fail again? It's 116 just about, as I recall. Yeah, 115.98 is I've got it. 
This looks to be a bounce point to me. Getting uh, into that is problematic at the moment because we've had a big breakdown of, let me say, that trend line, also a trade line for me. But that's a very, very dominant break of that trade line. I'd love to have seen a pullback to it to actually get short here. I can't go short right now because the longer term picture is showing me that this has to go long. But then I look at this and I've got a big double top and I've got a clear lower low and I've got a clear lower high. So this is suggesting to me short term, at least, that we are going short. So not as clear as you might think that this is at a, at a support level. I want to see a retest of that broken trend line. And then I would look to trade this short, short to medium term. Two more to go. And these are the ones that I think are probably the best, apart from uh, Aussie CAD. I think Aussie CAD is a good uh, conveyance long, but CAD yen, um, and I know it's really easy to go, okay, the yen is the weakest water and you can trade just about everything against it. But if you look at the bigger picture on CAD yen, uh, it has now broken long-term resistance, which has been supported in the past. I think this has got real prospects to go higher. Uh, getting into it again is the tricky part. Weekly chart is showing us one, two, three, four, for four weeks, five weeks in a row. You've got to see some pullback, but um, I think this is a wonderful, wonderful opportunity to trade this long term. Uh, you just need to see some. Buy the dips is what I'm saying. Anything that dips here, I think, is a buying opportunity on CAD yen. And finally, Euro Aussie, which uh, is what Gordon was speaking about before. Exactly the same category, I think, as, uh, as CAD yen. This is now broken down long-term support. And any rally here is a sell, in my humble opinion. How do we find that? Uh, well, it, every single trade line that I put on my chart is broken. And I'm just looking for a pullback to any one of those. Uh, this one, daily chart's a little bit problematic. <clears throat> it's got to come back a fair way, but um, weekly chart, I think this time next week, if I saw a rally, I'd certainly be looking to trade that. But I don't know that I'm going to get that opportunity because it's so bearish. Uh, any any rally here, in my humble opinion, gives me an op a selling opportunity. So that is the way I'm looking at it, mate. There's some very, very clear breaks of support and resistance, and I'll be looking to take advantage of those over the coming week. Looks like another really good trading week, Eliza Head. Uh, Jeff, thank you very much uh, for mm. that. And to the team, uh, cheers. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, it is, uh, and to the team, thank you very much. It is great to have the whole team in, uh, be it live or recording. It is nice to have you guys all taking part. Uh, if you're a trader and you've watched that, remember you can uh, now wait for the recordings to come out. My week, cutting this up and doing the small section recordings going forward. So if you watch the whole thing and you're not quite sure you want to have a look at Ash or want to have another look at somebody else, you can do that. Remember, if you want to catch Ash and Jeff, uh, Trading Buddies show is on YouTube. You can catch it on the Telegram channels for all the times for that. In the meantime, guys, have a good week. Remember, stay calm and make good decisions. And if you do that, it will all work out over time. Cheers, everyone. Have a good night. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks to the team. Thanks to mine.